church. We're so glad that you could be here this morning. Let's stand and let's get ready to worship the Lord together. Amen. Amen. to the Lord. And so sometimes we find ourselves striving in the flesh, 
to win a battle that is not even ours. And so while we worship him today, what we want to do is we want to release those things that we're struggling with in life. We want to release those to God and say, God, I trust you. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my job. I trust you with every aspect of my life. And today I will worship you as though everything's already been taken care of because you go before me. You're the one that wins the battle. Amen. Glory to God. So let's do that today. Let's worship him as though the thing you're facing, you've already overcome. Amen. Father, we bless you today. We worship you with our whole heart. We worship you from the innermost part of our being because you're the one. You're the one that causes us to stand in victory. You're the one who causes us to overcome and to triumph. So today we worship you as though nothing exists that could take us down because you're the one who puts us over. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Let's worship him.
Lord, I thank you for your presence, Lord. Lord, I thank you that it's that it's not us, that we can just be used by you, Lord. It's all about you. It's all for you. It's all, it's all about you, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for this time. Lord, open our hearts to receive your word this morning. Let us be changed by you. Let us not leave here the same as we walked in the door, Lord. We are here to be changed by you. So, God, I rebuke any distraction, Lord. I toss it aside in the name of Jesus. And we just come here at your feet this morning to learn and to know more about you. We give it all to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, church, we're so excited that you're here this morning. Take a few seconds, greet someone next to you. The sermon video will be on shortly. Everybody loves Jesus today. Would you give God a good amen? I'm so uh, glad to see you in the house of God today. It's always a pleasure uh, just to be with the body of Christ and to get to worship God together. Uh, we've got just a, 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 I believe every message is important when in reference to the gospel, but we've been walking through a very timely series t- entitled, Are You Ready? And, and I want to get you ready for the word, but first let me get uh, some things out of the way, and, and that way we can just let God have his way. First of all, uh, I see brand new faces, and we're so excited to have guests here this morning. We want to welcome you, and I would ask you if you would take time to please fill out a connection card. Uh, if you're online, you can do this online at lakeviewpeople.com. Uh, can we take a second just to greet our online audience? God bless all of y'all for being with us. We're thankful you're tuning in. And you can find the connection cards. Maybe you got one in your worship guide. If not, they're available in the seat pockets nearby. And if you just would uh, submit one of those to us. We've got our first impressions team that will be back at the information table after service. Or some may even be by the doors. And uh, you can hand those to one of the team members. And we have a, a, just a gift to say thank you for being with us. And we're so uh, happy that you're here. I also want to remind you, even if you're not a guest, you can utilize the connection card to update your information or to signify a next step. We've already got six or seven scheduled to be water baptized on Easter Sunday. Anybody excited to baptize on Resurrection Sunday? I think that's awesome. If you would like to be water baptized, you can sign up online at lakeviewpeople.com slash baptism. You can just circle it there on a connection card, and we'll reach out and contact you. And we just rejoice with those that are making public their love, their, their commitment to Jesus Christ. I also want to tell you, speaking of Easter, of some really... Uh, joyful, exciting things. Uh, you know, it was a couple of years since we've had our last Easter extravaganza because of this whole pandemic situation. And I'm just proud to say that God is still God and the church is still the church, even through all these last couple of years. And we're excited just to get back uh, to something we love to do with the community, a way to give back. On Saturday, April 16th, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., we're hosting our Easter extravaganza. It's open to the whole community. Uh, There's going to be, we've got over 10,000 eggs uh, full of candy and prizes that that we'll have for the kids. Now, the egg hunt will happen right at noon. The event is two hours, and we have the egg hunt right in the middle, right at noon, so that you can let people know 
We'll also have bounce houses, uh, pony rides, a petting zoo. We're going to be serving food and having a lot of fun for the entire family. So uh, help spread the word about that. That will be happening the day before Easter Sunday. That's April the 16th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we need a lot of help to, to put this together. So if you're interested in serving, we'll have opportunities starting next Sunday, ways you can sign up and get involved. Uh, to help us hand out food or help with kiddos, whatever you'd like to do. And uh, we thank you just for having such a heart for the community. Then Easter is that weekend, and actually we have a special service that night. We're going to have three services that weekend. Notice I didn't say three services on Sunday. Can I get a hallelujah from the leadership team? Uh, we're going to have a Saturday night, 6 o'clock service, because God has been growing his church, and we're excited about that. So on that Easter weekend, when we have so many guests as well, uh, we're going to widen the nets a little bit. So Saturday night at 6 o'clock, we'll have a worship service. And people were wondering, it's going to be the, the same quality. We're going to have ministry for kids, nursery, the whole thing. So invite people that Saturday night at 6. Then we have our two regular service times on Sunday morning at 9.30 and 11.15 a.m. And that will give me time to eat a power bar in between all of that stuff. And will you pray with us now for souls to be saved? I don't care about just having a nice Easter service. I want to see a difference made for the kingdom of God and for the glory of Jesus Christ. So everything we're doing, that's why. That's why we, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to bait and switch people. They're coming to the Easter extravaganza. It's because we want to tell them about Jesus and tell them that Jesus loves them and that he's coming again soon. I, I firmly believe that. And that leads me into this morning's message. But first, I want to thank you for being so faithful to give uh, we've got three ways you can give here at Lakeview. You can give online at lakeviewpeople.com slash give. You can use the text to give number on the screen, or that's also found on the website. It just takes a few moments to set that up. Or you can use the offering envelopes that are located in the seats nearby. And it's because of your generosity that we're able to do these things for the community, that we're able to make such an impact in world missions and through benevolence and in that way. So thank you for being faithful to give under the Lord. I want to ask you if you would look with me at the Word of God as we look today at part four of this Are You Ready series entitled, Are Your Actions Ready? We've been looking at each aspect of our life these last few weeks, and next week will be kind of the final week that we look internally about are we ready, and then we're going to focus on what has God called us to do to be workers in the harvest, but we want to look at our actions. Last week we talked about our thoughts, we've talked about our, our words, the things that we speak, and just life itself, and in Matthew 24, this has been our key scripture, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. It says, later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, and his disciples came to him privately and said, tell us... When will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? And I believe that it's significant that Jesus says, don't let anyone mislead you. This is a warning that there will be some that will try to mislead. We know the enemy is trying to confuse the issue. And I believe that we are living in the end times. Personally, I believe we're living in toward the end of what the Bible calls the church age. That would be the end of the end times. And I believe the return of Jesus is near. The rapture of the church is near. That's my personal belief. And I'll show you scripturally why I believe that. But here's the thing. It don't matter what anybody thinks. It matters what we know from the word of God. And that's that Jesus is coming again. Amen. And I'm excited about that. And he doesn't want us to be misled. So this leads to the thought, Jesus wants us to be aware of what's going on and what God's word says about the season that we find ourselves in. And although his disciples came to him privately to ask this question, notice that God had this conversation preserved in his holy word so that we could be reading it 2,000 years after this conversation happened and be ready to hear the word of God for such a time as this. So I want to ask you please to pray with me and pray for me for God's word to go forth as he wants it. Heavenly Father, I thank you for being a, a God that you are never caught off guard by no matter what's happening in the world. So we trust you today for your word to go forth. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place, I ask in the name of Jesus and all in agreement said, amen and amen. I know many people are probably asking some form of this question. And that is, what is happening? I don't even think you have to be a Christian or very spiritual to realize there is a lot more going on in the world than meets the eye. Can I get a good amen to that observation? There's so much happening. And, and there's so much 
significant spiritually that's going on in the world. And, and Jesus said, don't let anybody mislead you. And then he began to give description and instruction to his disciples. And again, it was preserved and recorded in the word of God so that we, his disciples today, his followers right now, could be prepared and not be unaware of what was happening in the world. In Matthew 24, verses 6 through 8, Jesus said, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars. Sound familiar to anybody? But then he says, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. He goes on to say, nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Well, thank you for that good news, Jesus. He said it, not me. But he wanted us to know this in advance. And many of the things that he describes, he'll say, see, I have told you this beforehand. I'm letting you know what is happening. And I just want to submit to you some things from the Word of God. This will not be in your notes. So if you want to write this down and turn to this uh, verse of Scripture, you may have different translations in the crowd. I'm going to read from the New King James Version, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38. Verses 1 through 6. Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 through 6. And I just want you to listen to the word of God as it concerns the wars and rumors of wars. And I think even what we're seeing happen with Russia and Ukraine is very significant to Bible prophecy. And speaks to the age that we find ourselves in. It says in Ezekiel 38, verse 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. Notice that. Gog of the, man of, of the land of Magog. Gog, I believe, is very clearly a person. Is it, Ezekiel is instructed to prophesy against this person. And they appear to be the leader of this conglomeration of countries and nations. One of them is Magog because it's Gog of Magog which that would be redundant. Some believe Gog is just a metaphor, something like that. How many of y'all know the Bible's not a fairy tale? These are real places and real situations that were prophesied. It says uh, Magog actually, you, you got to remember that the Bible was not written with a Western mentality, but a Hebrew mentality, a, a, an Eastern mentality. And these were real places. And if you know your Bible history, y'all, I didn't do real well in geography in school. But praise the Lord for Google, hallelujah. And you can find a map of what the, the Bible times, what the countries were called and what they looked like. And actually Magog is in the same land place as the nation of Russia and Ukraine. And it also might include, depends on what Bible scholar uh, you, know, you want to listen to, but it also may include parts of Kazakhstan, which again is a satellite of Russia. All that, all that area is described as Magog. Okay, so this is very significant. This was prophesied centuries ago that this was going to happen. And I want you to see something else. This is going to be very deep, so follow this thought. Ezekiel chapter 38 is after Ezekiel chapter 37. What? Did I just impress you with my Bible knowledge? I watched Sesame Street, y'all. And in Ezekiel chapter 37, it was prophesied about the restoration of Israel as a nation. So there are people that think, you know, well, I wonder what it was like to be alive when Hitler rose to power. A lot of people thought Hitler was the Antichrist. I might would have in that time, honestly. Because he, he was so horrible to the, to the Jewish people. Millions. And y'all, that really happened too. That was not a fairy tale. Amen. They're trying to change the history books. I'm thankful that this book is unchanging. And that God protects and preserves it. But Hitler was not the Antichrist. I believe he may have been kind of a foreshadowing, a type or a metaphor of, of the rise of the Antichrist. But something significant had not happened yet in that era. Israel was not the, the established nation that it is now. Because in 1948, Israel became a nation. And it was in the 60s that actually Jerusalem was reestablished as the capital of Israel. And those have huge ramifications in end times Bible prophecy. So when we're talking about Gog and Magog, I believe Gog to be the ruler that is going to be positioned 
who will have influence in all these other nations that are listed in these six verses of Ezekiel chapter 38 and all throughout chapter 38 and 39. If you really want to confuse yourself, go home and read Ezekiel today. It'll, but, it's, but it's good, it's good, but you've got to put some study. You've got to make effort. Anybody believe the Word of God deserves our effort? I watch people, they can't, they, they start binge watching something on Netflix and you're like, I can't put, I just can't stop clicking. I gotta watch the whole season. I gotta watch the whole thing. I wish we were that way with the word of God because all of this fits together, church. The Bible, all of it is valuable. All of it is good. And so Magog, Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan. And then it says in the Prince of Rosh, some translations may not say Rosh. It may use a different name. Rosh is Russia. I, I believe that very firmly. It's, it's very clear. Some, again, try to argue that this is all metaphor or whatever. I don't believe that. I don't believe God would put it in his holy word if it was just a metaphor. It, it's Meshach and Tubal. Now, you'll see those two places. And later on in verse 6, you'll see Gomer and uh, Tugarma, which these four locations all are found in modern-day Turkey. Okay, so you've got Russia, you've got Ukraine, you've got Turkey mentioned here. I'm going to skip to verse 5. It talks about Persia. That one's easy. Persia is literally Iran. And I don't know if anybody's noticed Iran is a big player in the world right now with nuclear weapons, and they're not real fond of Israel or the United States. So you've got Persia, which is Iran. Then depending on your translation, it may say Ethiopia. The most literal translation, the most accurate, would actually be the word Cush, C-U-S-H. Anybody have a translation that says Cush? A few of you. Lots of you. Okay. And so... That, if you go to Bible history, look geographically where Cush is located, it was south of modern-day Egypt. And the nation that's right there currently is the nation of Sudan. And you may know, Sudan recently had a bit of a civil war. They split northern Sudan, which is right there at the southern part of Egypt, is extremely, uh, they're, they're Islamic extremists. They're very anti-Israel. And Russia has a huge force right there. Did you know that mainstream news did not, does not always report on all the news? They like to pick and choose what we see, what we hear. But you can find on very reputable news sites with a simple internet search the fact that NATO is very concerned with Russia's involvement in Turkey, in the Middle East, in Sudan. They're actually trying to build a base in Sudan so they'll have presence in the Red Sea. They haven't had that in decades. This is happening right now, but all the attention is on Ukraine because that gets the most views on the news. But all this other stuff really pertains to Bible prophecy. Uh, it goes on to say, uh, and put, which is west of Egypt. It also may say Libya. That is, that's modern-day Libya. And it can also include parts of Algeria, Morocco. They're with them. In verse 6, it even says, many people are with you. So there may be more nations than this that get involved, but these are kind of the front runners, kind of the ones that will encircle Israel. And look at verses 3 and 4. It says, and say, so he's telling, God is telling Ezekiel, and say, thus says the Lord God, he's speaking to Gog, the leader of all this, behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, which again, I believe proves that this is a person, not a nation. Gog is a person. The prince of Rosh, which would be Russia, Meshach and Tubal, which is Turkey. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws. This is so important. Put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen. And goes on to describe. The hook in the jaw is very significant. Culturally, in Ezekiel's day, what the hook was used was in the jaw of, of beasts of burden, like donkeys or mules or cattle. When they weren't going the way they needed them to go, they would put a hook in their mouth to pull them to the way they needed to go. So it's saying to Gog, whoever the leader may be, and I believe all the dominoes are set up that this could be Vladimir Putin. I, I genuinely believe that. I don't know it for sure. I'm not setting any dates, but I'm telling you, you better be watching because it would all fit with Bible prophecy. And it says that whoever Gog is, there will be a hook set in their mouth, which means they'll be led to do something by God that they may not even really want to do. They'll feel like there's no other option. And I just heard reported the other day, they're talking about Russia because of all of these sanctions. How severe these sanctions are, that they're getting desperate. You probably have heard that or seen that in the news. And again, I don't think you have to be some great war tactician to realize the more desperate a nation gets, the more dangerous they can become. And they're saying they're looking to turn their attention to other places because these sanctions are not planned to be lifted even if they were to pull out of Ukraine right now. 
because of all the things they've done and the war crimes that have been committed. So this is going to alter human history one way or the other, and I believe it points to Bible prophecy because it says that a hook will be put in your jaw and all these will be led to attack Israel. And it talks about the battle of Gog and Magog. And you can read more about that in Ezekiel 38 and 39. But listen to what's happening right now today in the world is that Israel has just uncovered a huge natural gas reservoir that Europe wants. They don't want to get their oil from Russia anymore, their natural gas. They want to get it from Israel. I've long wondered what would be the hook that would make Russia, why would they attack them. And they're in cahoots with so many Middle Eastern nations. They've got bases and military. They're doing military, military drilling all in the Mediterranean area, area to show their strength. Do you see how quickly the dominoes could fall? Y'all, yeah. this is all end of the end kind of stuff. And the stage is being set. Jesus said, don't let anyone mislead you. But he also was letting you know, I'm going to give you some warning. You're going to see the signs and the seasons is another way he describes it. And you've got to remember that the Hebrew culture, seasons didn't just mean summer, uh, fall, winter, spring. They were speaking more so about storm seasons. Where we as in Texas, we know when it's tornado season, right? That's what the Hebrew culture usually is talking about when it talks about seasons. They were talking about specific times of the year when the atmosphere is right for a storm to happen. And here's the way I say this in my Texas way is that not every storm produces a tornado but every tornado requires a storm and saints just be awake be alert and be aware that in the spiritual world and in bible prophecy there is a storm of ruin and i'm not saying that every storm produces a tornado but you got to have one to have a tornado and at some point the big storm is going to hit that leads us to the end of the age and, and I believe this is one possibility. And I don't say this to make anyone afraid, but hopefully to make the church aware of the time that we're living in. Is it said there will be wars and, and rumors of wars, and then there will be famines and earthquakes. And we've seen all the earthquakes all across the world. These are happening all the time. And they're predicting a great food shortage. Again, this is just common knowledge. This isn't like you had to dig in some... You know, Bible history to find this. They're saying right now today because Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. Have you heard that phrase in the news? That they're predicting people will starve to death in third world countries. Y'all, we're going to feel it here, but we're insulated in a lot of ways. We are very blessed. I hope you know that we are very blessed. And often people have wondered, why is the United States not mentioned as much in Bible prophecy? I think part of that is because we are insulated a bit and sheltered from certain things that will happen. But that should not make us feel comfortable or complacent. We have a work to do. We've been positioned for such a time as this. We have been supernaturally protected because we have been one nation and are still one nation under God. I declare that. But you need to be aware again of where we're, where we're at and there's two questions that arise from all of this and I believe people are asking themselves, first of all, if you want to jot this down, people are asking, what do you want God to do about all this? About us being in the end times if we are. So, and again, I'll tell you from my heart of hearts, it's not to scare you or to try to coerce people to come to church. I'm just letting you know, I, I don't care as much about people coming to church as people going to heaven and I believe time is very short. And we need to be very aware of the time that we're living. And so when we're asking the question, what do you want God to do? A big thing I've seen over these last two years of the pandemic is most people, can I be honest with you? I was one of them. I have been one of them. So this is not with judgment, but just with honesty. Most people have been asking God just to make us go back to normal. Please, God, can we have our old life back? It makes me think of the Israelites who they get out of Egypt and then they want to go back to Egypt because at least there was food there. At least, at least we, had, we, we knew what we were getting. We need to be careful that we don't just want comfort. Look, God is trying to draw us to something greater. Do you want things to just go back to normal, or do you want God to make all things new and get us back to perfection? That's where we're headed. That, that's what I'm all about. Amen. I want to get to that new heaven and that new earth. So these things have to happen. Certain things have to happen for a baby to be born, and it's called birthing pain. Certain things have to happen for Jesus to return. The Bible prophesies and foretold it. So the second question is kind of like it, and it's very important too, is... You're asking, what do you want God to do? But I want to ask, what does God want you to do for the day that we live in? Because I love this, this. I didn't come up with this, but I'm going to borrow it because it's so good. The analogy of running the race. Scripture talks about letting us run the race that's set before us. We have a race set before us. 
and culturally, when that was written in the Greek times, this is when the, the Olympics were, were beginning, you know, the fledgling of all these games and things like that. And one of the most popular uh, competitions they had was the relay race. And many historians believe this was talking about that re- of running the race set before us. And what do they do in a relay race? They hand off the baton to the next person, right? Every person. There's usually you know, four legs or so like that, and they hand off the baton to different people. And who do they save at the end? They call them the anchor. The final runner is usually the fastest. Because they say, we know the end matters a lot, and we want somebody that can get us to the finish line as quickly as possible. Did you know the Bible foretells and forewarns that as these things happen, like the tribulation, all these things, that it's going to start getting worse and worse and worse and faster and faster and faster? So I believe that we have been allowed to be alive for such a time as this, not to give you any arrogance, but give you awareness of how important you are to the kingdom of God. And this point in history, all the Bible prophets and all the people that wrote this, they're handing us the baton, church, and they're saying there is a harvest out there, and the harvest is ripe, and time is of the essence, and it's time we take up our position, our part, and run the race set before us to say Jesus is real, and he really is coming again soon. Shout it from the rooftops. Let people know we actually believe what we say we believe. I think people have gotten tired of a weak church. People have gotten tired of a church that says one thing on a Sunday and does another thing all the other days of the week. We say we love you, but we can't even work up the courage to talk to you about Jesus. Forgive us, Lord, and help us not to be the same anymore. So yes, what do we want God to do? The question is, what does God want you to do? He wants you to do. Think about what happened. One of the, in Matthew 24, we looked last week and a couple of times how Jesus said that it was going to be like in the days of Noah. What did Noah do? Whatever God told him. Even if it was build a giant boat in a world that had never seen rain. God may ask the church to do things that are uncomfortable, that aren't popular, We shouldn't care about being popular. We should care about being righteous before God. And if God tells us to do something that goes against culture, Noah got made fun of, he got ridiculed, he wasn't the most popular person in the world. And too many pastors, I've fallen into that trap before, you want so bad for people to like you, you're you're tempted to compromise the gospel, and we should never do that. Never water it down. Never never mix it up or feel like we got to help God out. Speak the truth in love. Noah just did his thing, and that's what we need to do. Whatever God asks us to do, do it. My namesake, Daniel. Everybody knows the account of Daniel in the lion's den. These are not fairy tales, church. These really happen. Daniel was a captive in a hostile land, the Babylonian Empire. And and they even changed his name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel got his name changed to uh, Belshazzar. And I'm so thankful that my parents chose to call me Daniel instead of Belshazzar uh, to honor his memory. But... When he lived, he had been taken captive, and you know all the, the story of uh, the, the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow down to the, the, the golden image. And Daniel, when he was thrown into the lion's den, what did Daniel do to fight against culture? He fought spiritually. He didn't get out and just raise pickets. He wasn't worried about a bunch of politics. He was worried about setting the example. He said, I don't care if you pass laws. If they go against the law of God, I will not honor them. I will honor the Lord. And the church needs to get that kind of resolve. Because can I tell you, Jesus also said persecution is coming. And there is a day in many parts of the world it's already arrived. And again, we've been insulated, but it's coming. And we need to make sure now that we are committed to the things of God. Think of David and Goliath. You want to talk about a fight? Maybe the most famous fight in, in all of Scripture is David and Goliath. But how did David even get to the fight? How did he even get to the battlefield? By serving Serving as a shepherd boy. Even the day of the battle, how did he get there? He was bringing food to his brothers. Can I tell you, church, we don't need to be looking for a fight. We need to be looking for the lost. Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. So we need to be serving. We need to be loving people. We need to be doing what God's asked us to do. Our greatest example is Jesus Christ. And Jesus faced off against Satan himself. A lot of people say the devil's really been fighting me. No, he's not, buttercup. Okay, can I just correct our theology? Satan is not omnipresent. So he can't be fighting you and your cousin Sue and your best friend too, okay? He, he just can't do it. I'm really glad those rhymed. I just did that. That was the Holy Spirit. No, I'm just kidding. But for real, the devil can't be everywhere at once. So you may have been facing off some low-level demon or something. I don't know. 
But I doubt very many of us have ever faced Lucifer himself. But Jesus did. And how did he fight him? He didn't throw hands. He didn't even use jujitsu. He used the word of God. Jesus, who yes, while he was fully human, he was still fully God. And he confronted and ran off Satan himself. And church, get this, the New Testament hadn't even been recorded yet. Most of what he quoted to the devil was in Deuteronomy. So quit saying the Old Testament ain't worth reading because Jesus used it to defeat the devil. All of the word of God is true and good and useful. This is why we want so bad for you to get into the Bible. This is the why. Man, I grew up in church, and they told me what to do, but I didn't always understand why. We're trying to go above and beyond to say why. Time is of the essence. The Word of God is the light into our path. It's going to direct us through these dark times. You need to get the Word of God so you won't be misled by the words of men or the enemy. So what, what, what did we do? Okay, this is what God wants us to do is just like the Bible heroes. If he asks you to, to do something like Noah, do it. If he asks you to stand up for something like David, do it. If he asks you to serve in the midst of the battle like David, do it. Well, do what Jesus did. Use the word as a weapon. In Hebrews chapter 10, these last parts, I'm going to go quickly. In the word of God, I get emotional just, just thinking about what it says. It's sobering words. And the Bible preaches better than I ever could. So I just want to read the word of God and I pray the Holy Spirit softens your heart to, to hear what it says. Because it's very clear, okay? I don't care what culture says. I don't even care what some church cultures say. We should never try to water down or change the word of God. It should change us. So please listen to instruction from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 24 through 29. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to go riot in the streets. Not at all. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. Catch this, but encourage one another. Don't gossip about one another. Can I tell you, there's a lot of people in the church that are struggling. And they're struggling with the enemy and the world and their past don't, don't make them fight against us too. Let's fight for them. Let's be on their side. Encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And can we just pause there and acknowledge, I want you to hear me say it. I believe the day of the return of Jesus is drawing near. I don't know if I can say it any clearer than that. I don't believe we have much longer. And regardless of when he comes back, the Bible even says he may delay his return. And that's up to him, okay? But you're not promised tomorrow either way. So please take seriously the scope of eternity and what it means. Here's the part. It hits hard. We can't shy away from the word of God. He says, dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning, that word deliberately is key. If we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which has made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. God forgive us in the church when we wanted so bad for people to come to church that we made grace a plaything for sin. Grace is not a license to sin. You were bought with a mighty price. The life of Jesus Christ was given for you. So it is not too much that God asks us to give us our life to his cause, to his kingdom, to his purpose. Our life is not our own anymore because of what, how it was paid for. And we should not treat it with disrespect. No more can we say, that's just the way I was born. Be born again in the name of Jesus Christ. Be made new by the power of Jesus. The power of God is greater than the power of the enemy. Satan tries to make a counterfeit, but God can make all things new. And that even means my bad attitude. 
We should not deliberately. Look, church, it's one thing to struggle in sin. There are many in the church that battle with addiction. That's when we say we want people to know God, and the very next step is we want you to find freedom because it's a struggle sometimes. You don't have to do that alone. Again, here's the why we have things like celebrate recovery. It's because you don't need to do it alone. Yes, it may be uncomfortable to go to a group and talk to people about your issues. But I tell you, it's a blessing to go talk to people who won't talk about you. They'll pray for you. And you know what? It probably will feel awkward at first. That's because the devil knows that's where you can find healing and freedom. The Bible says when we confess our sins to one another, then we find healing. And some of you have been carrying the same stuff for years and years because you're carrying it alone. And God's saying, there is a better way. My word tells you a better way. But you have to obey to receive the promise and the blessing. So every Tuesday at 6.30, we got CR. We've got life groups that happen. If you're not a part of a life group, you can still come every Wednesday night at 6.30. Tuesday, 6.30, Wednesday, 6.30, we get in small group settings where we can talk about personal things and what's going on in our life and in the world around us. Because there's two things that we need to do and remain doing in conclusion to, to what God's word says. We find ourselves living in the season that we're living in. And number one, we need to keep watching. Keep watch, church. I believe this. It's not in your notes. Just a thought that the Lord dropped into my heart. Looking for Jesus should cause you to look like Jesus. The more you're aware of eternal things, the less you'll care about temporary things. I can testify of that. It changes your focus, changes your perspective, and that will change your life. When you're only thinking about selfish things, which I've done a lot, okay? Again, this is spoken with no judgment, but hopefully you can learn from my mistakes instead of having to repeat my mistakes. When we're just focused on selfish things, on comfort, and you'll see it in your prayer life where it's like, Lord, I just want things to go back to normal. If I just had more of this, if I just had more money, if I just had more time, if I just had more friends, if I just had more blah, 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 blah. Can I tell you, if I lose everything on this earth, but I got Jesus, I'm going to be just fine. I'm going to be just fine. All this stuff's going to pass away anyway. But his word will never pass away. That's what scripture says. And so we need to keep watching for his return. Jesus said it in Matthew 24, verses 42 through 44. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Yeah, if if I knew a a robber was coming to my house tonight, I'd be sitting there with a shotgun waiting to greet him. You ring that doorbell, I'm going to ring your bell, sucker. You know what I'm saying? If we knew, if we knew. So we always should keep watch and be ready. Jesus said this. The second thing we got to do, this is a call to the the church, is we got to keep working. I mean, look at what happened when Jesus ascended the first time. His followers were just staring at the sky, wondering, where did he go? And there's a lot of people in the church right now staring at the sky wondering, when's he going to come back? It was, so, it was so absurd that actually the angel of the Lord had to come down and tell him, shoo, go do what he said, which was go into all the world. You can't go into all the world if you're just staying, staring. And you can't go into all the world if the only time you're in the word is, is in these gatherings. I'm glad you're here. We need you every day. The body of Christ, the kingdom, needs you every day. Being a testimony, a light in the darkness. We've got to keep working. I want to read these last two passages in the Amplified Translation because it just expounds and speaks so clearly to what the Word of God is saying. In Luke chapter 2, on chapter 10, verse 2, I'm sorry. He was saying to them, The harvest is abundant, for there are many who need to hear the good news about salvation. Would anybody say amen to that fact? But the workers, and that is defined as those available to proclaim the message of salvation. The workers, those who are proclaiming the message of salvation are few. And again, don't put this all on me. Because I'm your pastor. Remember, I'm not your preacher. There's a difference in the word. When it talks about preaching the gospel, that's not just for pastors. That's for everybody. That means to declare the word. To let people know you're supposed to be declaring. The pastor's role is to equip the saints for ministry. So let's get y'all out there ministering. Hallelujah. And so it says the workers are what are few. Therefore, prayerfully ask the Lord of the harvest 
to send out workers into his harvest. And let me give you some encouragement. It may sound as correction, because it was for me, but I'm glad that God corrects those that he loves. When it says that we should prayerfully ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, that means we shouldn't waste our time bashing other ministries. I can't stand seeing the body of Christ fighting among, again, we got an enemy that's fighting against us. Let, let's not fight amongst ourselves like this. I saw, I read where uh, Pastor Brian Houston, he's a pastor of Hillsong, ever heard of that real struggling little church in Australia? Uh, he, he had, he was asked to step down, he resigned uh, just in the last few days, and it was a really sad situation what led up to it, and some, some moral failure and, and different things. I don't know the whole story, I'm not going to pretend to know, but it, it breaks my heart Sometimes when I see Christians ready to pounce on somebody who has had, a, who's had a, an issue, had a problem, who has sinned, the Bible says we should correct them in love and in gentleness. That's the word the Bible uses, in gentleness. And I'm tired of us acting like a tabloid site. I'm going to these qu- Christian we- websites, and all they're doing, it was like reading the tabloids. We should be better than that, church. We have to be better than that. I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't throw me away after my worst day and my lowest moment. Let's not do that to people. We need to live like Christ. And again, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. We need workers in the harvest. So if somebody's struggling who is a worker in the harvest, pray for them all the more and help them, help restore them. Because again, we don't want to be losing soldiers. We need to be gaining more. So how do we do it? Here's the final scripture before we participate in communion together today. Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. That is, in him, I have shared his crucifixion. That means Jesus paid it all. I get to be included in the crucifixion even though I didn't go through any of it. You didn't wear the crown of thorns. You didn't take those stripes on your back. You didn't get the nails in your hands and your feet. But you share in the payment. You get to be a part of that. That's huge. It is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. And let me just say again, there's the word of God saying we're without excuse. Again, don't say, well, I was born this way. Be born again in the name of Jesus. In Christ, you can live. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. And here's where it expounds. It explains what that means to live by faith, by adhering to. That word adhering literally means to cling to and be devoted to. It says, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you loved us. And while we were yet sinners, you went to the cross for us. Thank you, God. It was a heavy cross that he carried and an even heavier burden of all the sin of all humanity. Jesus carried for us so when the Bible says to take up your cross and follow him makes me think when I was a kid we had a grocery store where my mom would push a cart and it had have y'all ever seen grocery stores have the little kitty carts you know I'm a little three year old I was cute y'all follow mom around my little grocery cart do you know what my cart couldn't hold as much as hers could I didn't have to carry as much stuff as mama did but I had a cart just like her. When it says bear your cross, you're not having to bear the same kind of burden Jesus already bore for you. He's not asking too much of us, church. God's asking very little in comparison to what he's done for us. So how do we do it? Is live in him. Do it for him, not for anybody else, not even yourself. Do it for Jesus. Because you've disappointed yourself, haven't you? Jesus will never disappoint you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. The Bible calls him a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So even if your brother hadn't been that good, even if your family's turned your back, Jesus never will. He never will. How great is our Lord. What I want to do is give opportunity. I've shared with you historically, prophetically, as best to my ability and and with God's help, to try to alert the body of Christ to the season that I believe we're in. I believe the return of Jesus Christ. I don't care what you think about is it pre-trib or post-trib or mid-trib I just know Jesus is coming again and I've told you what I believe and why I believe it but can I tell you 
I believe that there is going to be a rapture of the church before the tribulation. And you're going to want to go in that, that time. Even if you don't believe in a pre-trib rapture, you better hope I'm right. Because the tribulation is going to be terrible. It's going to be terrible. You think it's bad now. The Bible says this is just the beginning. It actually says the last half of the tribulation, the last three and a half years, it's called the great tribulation. It says God will shorten those days because if he didn't, nobody would survive, not even the elect. So these people that think, oh yeah, I'll just, if I miss the rapture, I'll just, I'll, I'll be strong, I'll be beheaded. You're kidding yourself. Because right now, the church is here. The body of Christ is here. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? When we're gone, there's not going to be the same conviction of the Holy Spirit that there is right now. It's going to be even harder. Living is going to be harder. Believing in God is going to be hard. Everything's going to be harder. Don't chance it. So if you're under the sound of my voice and God's word is spoken to you and the Holy Spirit is drawing your heart and you say, you know, I've just got to be real. I, I don't know. I don't know that I'm in right standing with God. You will stand before God. It doesn't matter what I think about you or anybody else thinks about you. It matters what God knows about your heart. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel several people. That again, I tell you not to bring fear, but to bring awareness. The Holy Spirit is telling me to tell you, you're not promised tomorrow. And you could step into eternity at any point. And then again, Jesus is coming soon as well. So this is the most important decision we could ever make. And I want to read you what the Word of God says about salvation. Because I don't want people to live in fear of wondering, am I saved? The Bible says we all work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But it also says that perfect love casts out all fear. So when you really understand who God is and what God's done for you, it can relieve that so you can be doing what you're supposed to do, which isn't worrying, but working in the harvest. That's what we need to be doing. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, and that word declare is so important. If you openly declare, that means you let people know Jesus is Lord of my life. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a guarantee from the word of God. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raises him from the dead, for your salvation you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. I can't say it any better because that's the word of God. The Bible warns, Jesus warned in Luke 9, that whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. So sometimes, church, we've... we've for lack of a better term, we've made it too easy. We've tried to lower the bar for salvation. After all Jesus went through, let's not make light of making a decision for Christ. So if you're in this place, I'm not gonna have anybody bow your heads or close your eyes. You need to be bold. You need to be proud of who Jesus is. Not ashamed of your sin anymore. He died for your sin and shame. So don't let anybody judge you. Only God will judge you. And you are made righteous through Jesus Christ when you place your faith in him. But if you're in this place and you say, I know if I stood before God right now, I would not be in right standing, and I want to change that. I want to give my life to Jesus. Would you stand quickly? I'm not going to take long. I'm going to give you opportunity. God bless you. God bless you guys. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? I'm going to give you about five seconds. Some of you, the Holy Spirit's working on you. All I can say is just respond. I'm not going to try to, like, make you emotional. I just want to tell you, don't miss the opportunity of the drawing of the Holy Spirit. If you, if you sense him drawing you, respond. Give you about two seconds. Can we pray with these? And, and look, if you need to make this decision, you don't want to stand up, come talk to somebody. Do so, don't leave this place not knowing. I'm so proud of the boldness of these. Can we pray with them? And we're going to do just what God's word says. We're going to declare Jesus as Lord. It says we're saved by faith in Christ alone. So it doesn't matter what you've done. It's about what Jesus has done. So you put your faith in him and then you live your life for him. Can we pray together? And I'm going to pray for you. And pray with you. But you got to talk to God from your own heart. You don't need me to, to teach you how to say you're sorry. The Bible says you repent. That means you turn away from your old life. And you turn to God. And I want you just to start to do that right now. Tell God. Be honest with him. God, I've sinned against you. We all have. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means none of us are worthy. Only Jesus is. And God said, I know, I know that you need me, so I'm, I sent my only son to die for you. And believe in your heart that he raised from the dead to win the victory over sin and death for you. 
If it was just for you, he would have done it. So place your faith in him. Say, God, I ask your forgiveness of my sins, and by faith I receive your grace right now to be saved, changed forever by faith in Jesus Christ. You don't have to doubt it anymore. Give him your whole life. He can handle all of it. He bears all of our burdens. And God, we trust you as Savior, and I want you just to declare that. Say, Jesus is Lord of my heart and my life. Would you just testify that right where you're at? Jesus is Lord. Amen and amen. Would somebody rejoice with these that have made that awesome decision? God bless y'all. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to ask the worship team to come help me prepare to take communion. I hope you'll hang around. It'll just take a moment. But this is so important what we're about to do. As we enter into this season where people are mindful of the cross because of Easter and what it signifies, don't ever let it be watered down. We're celebrating the resurrection, not some eggs, okay? We're celebrating Jesus Christ the Lord. And the Bible says we participate in communion to remember that. So if there's anybody in here that would like to participate, and maybe you missed getting communion stuff, if you'll raise your hand, they've got it at the back. We've got some down here. If you just raise your hand high, they'll bring it to you. I'm going to ask the worship team to lead us. In just a moment, they're going to lead us in worship. Just the last part of that final song we sang, saying, you can have it all. It speaks of the one who gave us life. I mean, what can compare to what Jesus has given us? What he asked from us is so small in comparison. But let me give you instruction from Scripture. Because just like we read in the Word, we should not treat grace lightly. And we should reverence and honor the time of participating in communion. Now, we practice open communion here, which means you don't have to be a member of Lakeview Church to participate. But you do need to be a member of the body of Christ, a follower of Jesus. Because the Bible is very strict. It warns, don't participate in this in an unworthy way or, or take it lightly. You need to reverence who it represents and what it means. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves so here's what I'm going to ask as the worship team comes I want to give you a moment just to examine your heart ask the Holy Spirit to reveal anything that you need to get right before God and before we participate in communion can we participate together in just worshiping the Lord and saying Lord you mean so much to us this means so much to us and we will do whatever you ask us to do with this life that you've given us. I could ask you to stand and could we spend some time in worship together. For the one who gave me life Nothing is a sacrifice me how you want to go have your throne within my heart
talking about covenant. If you missed that, I encourage you to go back and rewatch those messages because we live in a contract society and a lot of people think they're in contract with God, which means you did something to deserve it. You brought something to the table. In a covenant, one side always pays more than the other. And in our covenant with Jesus, he paid it all. We just get to share. And now we're co-heirs with Christ. And all he asks in return is that we give back what he's already given us, our life. All this belongs to God anyway. He's saying, I just want you to trust me with the gift I've given and use it for my glory. With you having time to have examined your heart, I call upon the church now to participate with me in this time of communion, to, to honor Christ and do in remembrance of him. The instruction in that same chapter of 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 the Apostle Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you join me in giving thanks for the bread before we partake in it? Jesus, thank you for allowing your body to go through all that it went through for us for the stripes on your back, the crown of thorns on your head, the nails in your wrists and feet. You didn't deserve it. We deserved it, and you took our place. And we are so thankful. We do this now in remembrance of you. Would you participate in taking the bread? Thank you, Jesus. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant. There's that word. This new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Could you join me in thanking Jesus for his blood and the covenant that he paid for? Lord, I thank you, Heavenly Father, for sending your son to live and to die, and that he didn't stay dead, that he rose again. But his precious blood was spilled to buy back our salvation, and we thank you for paying that price, Jesus, and we do this in remembrance of your precious blood that was paid for us. In Jesus' name, would you partake of the cup with me? Finally, it says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Anybody believe Jesus is coming again? We need to tell people that. Tell them, yes, Jesus died, but he did not stay dead. He is alive. He is going to return, and he's coming soon. Keep watching and keep working, church. That's our call. That's our challenge. And Jesus is our source. Pastor Mark's going to come and dismiss us with prayer. I want to ask the prayer team to come. If you have a need of any kind, I want to ask you not to leave this place until you let somebody pray in agreement with you. So as they come and just gather here, they're ready to serve and ready to pray with you. But I want you to, to also leave this place knowing we've got such an opportunity and a responsibility to share the gospel with others. So don't take lightly the time that we're living in or the fact that you're alive now. Take that baton. Run the race that's set before you. And let's bring glory to Jesus Christ before we see him again face to face. Amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Mark to come and close us. Enjoyed a, a wonderful service today. And the presence of the Lord is so sweet. Um, our prayer team is down here. If you're in need of prayer today for any reason, uh, they're here to pray with you uh, confidentially, privately, but before God. Amen and in faith to receive an answer, the answer that you need. If you've made a decision for Christ today, and we want you to fill out a connection card, if you want to take a next step, like water baptism, you can use a connection card to fill that out. Indicate that you want to uh, be water baptized. That'll be the third Sunday of the month. That happens to be Easter. If you want to be water baptized on Easter Sunday, uh, we can accommodate you. Also, in your uh, worship guide, you would have found this morning an opportunity for service. We talked about serving today. Brother, uh, uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor talked about serving God and working for Him. One of the things that we're wanting to do 
in, in advance of Easter. This would be on the 9th, Saturday the 9th of April. The Iowa Park Little League Baseballs have their opening day. And what we want to do is for a couple hours, go out there and set up a tent, passing out invitations for our, ex, uh, egg, our Easter extravaganza, as well as our Easter services. We'll also pass out vouchers for the, the players and the parents and the coaches to get a free um, soft drink at the concession stand that we're going to be paying for those. And we're doing all of that as an opportunity. How many times are you going to find that many young people gathered in a place? And that, how many know on a hot day you want a soft drink? Amen. And it's not really a bait and switch. We're just earning the right to invite them. We say, we're going to give you this, but we're earning the right to invite you to something that could change your life. How many believe that Easter Sunday lives can be changed? Amen. And so if you want to be a part of that, if you want to be out there on that outreach team, uh, we'll have a free t-shirt for you. You'll have a t-shirt to wear. It says, serve and love. Amen. Uh, uh, and it'll, then it'll say Lakeview Church on it. And so we want you to be a part of that team. If you want to be a part of that team, please let me know. Just let me know. You can send me a text. You can send me an email. You can call me. You can just drop by and say, I want to be a part of that team. And we will let you know what's happening with that. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you again that you've called, called us to be lights in darkness. You've called us to go out into the world and to share that light, delivering people from the dominion of darkness, translating them into your kingdom, your kingdom of light. And we give you all the praise for it today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great time.